Uh, thank you very much for your kind words of introduction. And indeed, it is this man in the middle here, Ahmed Faisi Pasha, Ottoman Field Marshal at the time um, and Governor General of Yemen when this fo um, photo was taken, resplendent in his uniform and his many campaign medals uh, that he won, also mainly in, um, in, uh, in Southwest Arabia. So uh, tonight, uh, I have the honor to conclude the History Department's lecture series on heroes and villains in world history with a presentation on a man virtually unknown to the general public and a man to boot who served an empire that many people probably have never heard of. Uh, Ahmed Faisi Pasha, and I should say at the very beginning that uh, Pasha is an Ottoman rank. It's uh, a rank that um, a bureaucrat or a military officer um, was entitled to uh, when he, and we at this time we are all, um, only talking about men in, in state service, uh, when he reached uh, the rank of brigadier general in the military or of um, uh, provincial governor uh, if he was a civilian administrator, Ahmed Faisi Pasha, um, the man at the center of my talk, spent his entire career as a professional soldier and administrator in the service of the Ottoman Empire, one of the multi-ethnic, multi-religious, continental imperial powers that uh, disappeared from the world stage as a result of World War I, uh, like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, for example. And yet, the stays in the societies of southeastern Europe and the Middle East today uh, are deeply rooted uh, in, the, in this Ottoman past, and especially the last century of Ottoman rule, uh, before the end of the First World War. Understanding the Middle East today, therefore, requires us to study the ideas and actions of the Ottoman women and men who shaped uh, this late Ottoman state and society. My talk tonight is a small contribution to this larger endeavor. And I'm focusing here, obviously, on an elite figure. And uh, in doing that, I'm not making a claim that these are the only people we should study. And obviously, um, uh, there has, is now a very large body uh, of uh, extremely high-quality scholarly work that looks at Ottoman society from below. Here, I'm bringing to your attention a state functionary, uh, a military officer, uh, that uh, is, for a number of reasons, uh, of interest. And I argue that exploring Ahmed Fezi Pasha's record as a soldier and bureaucrat and asking which of his actions drew praise and criticism from whom and why allows us to gain a better understanding of Ottoman imperial rule during this crucial period at the turn of the 20th century. And as we will see, Ahmed Fezi was highly influential in terms of shaping Ottoman policy uh, in strategically important borderlands of the Ottoman Empire, and first and foremost in Southwest Arabia, in Yemen. Between the mid-1880s and his retirement in 1908. And argue, uh, arguably, one of the great imperial proconsuls of the late 19th and early 20th centuries um, is I mean, he is definitely one of those. And, uh, but unlike his contemporary Sir Evelyn Baring uh, in uh, Great Britain, uh, General Joseph Gallieni, one of the uh, foremost colonial administrators in turn of the century France, or Konstantin Petrovich von Kaufmann, who uh, was one of the, the leading figures of taking Ru Russia's mid-19th century expansion to Central Asia, Ahmed Faisi has received little, if any, scholarly attention. And my uh, lecture sheds light on uh, Faisi's highly contradictory record as an administrator and military man by focusing specifically on his three terms as a governor general of Ottoman Yemen, by far the most notorious travel spot of the Ottoman Empire, and importantly, the uh, last territory that the Ottomans really conquered uh, in their long history. He served there uh, longer than any, uh, than any other high-level Ottoman official. On one hand, his skills as an administrator and expert, quote-unquote, on local affairs, and his talent as a military commander kept local opposition to Ottoman rule at bay for years and were instrumental in crushing two large-scale uprisings that brought Ottoman rule in Yemen to the brink of collapse. While these actions earned Faisi the admiration of both the Ottoman central government and specifically his patron, uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, 
uh, and also of foreign observers, he was widely known to run a money extortion network that included relatives, Ottoman officials, and local elites, and that systematically overtaxed local residents on a massive scale and seriously undermined the legitimacy of Ottoman rule uh, in this part of Arabia. His success in leading counterinsurgency operations in Yemen and his superior knowledge of local affairs allowed Ahmed Faisi to make himself indispensable to his superiors in Istanbul and to shield his cronies from prosecution until his patron, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, himself lost power in 1908. Uh, Ahmed Faisi's career is full of dramatic episodes. For example, his power struggle with a chief investigator sent from Istanbul in 1892, or his five-day camel ride across the Arabian desert in 1905, when he was rushed from southern Iraq to Yemen in order to assume command uh, of Ottoman military forces at the most dire moment of the 1904-1906 uprising against Ottoman rule. Uh, looking at Ahmed Faisi, the Ottoman empire builder and hero, quote unquote, and Ahmed Faisi, the frontier villain, again in quotes, allows us to bring to life a little known but nevertheless crucial chapter of Middle East history in the age of high imperialism. Ahmed Faisi, in many ways, embodies the, the dilemmas of the late Ottoman Empire that still possessed the capabilities to expand, but at the same time undermined the possibilities for its continued existence. A brief, note of, um, on, uh, brief, a brief note on my sources is also in order here. Whereas high-ranking British, French, or Russian imperial bureaucrats, the Cromers, the Gordons, the Kitcheners, the Gallienis, Lyotes, uh, and others have left historians uh, with a wealth of sources, including personal correspondence, diaries, memoirs, very few, if any, of these materials survive in the case of their Ottoman contemporaries. There are several reasons for that. Uh, most of the big Istanbul mansions to which many high-ranking Ottoman officials retired after decades of service for sultan and empire were made of wood. And a large number of these konaks, these mansions as Ottomans called them, perished as a result of the many fires uh, that ravaged huge portions of Istanbul during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, and we have to assume that along with these houses often perished the personal papers of their owners. It seems also that to a significant degree, the private archives of the late Ottoman Empire's bureaucratic and military elites also fell victim to the nation-building policies of the empire's principal successor state, the Republic of Turkey, proclaimed in 1923. For the leaders of the republic, uh, it was imperative to cut the cultural ties that connected the citizens of the new Turkish nation to their Ottoman past. One crucial element in this connection was the switch from the Arabic to the Latin alphabet uh, in the writing and printing of Turkish that came into effect in 1928. As a result, the number of people who were able to read Turkish and Arabic script steadily dwindled over the next few decades, and along with it, the interest of a younger generation to preserve the personal papers uh, that their grandparents and great-grandparents had produced during the final decades of the Ottoman Empire. To the best of my knowledge, Ahmed Fezi Pasha is not an exception in this regard. My attempts to locate his descendants and his personal papers have remained unsuccessful, and as far as I'm aware, he did not leave any memoirs. Any attempts, to, therefore, to shed light on his life, um, therefore, has, has to rely on his uh, resume, that is included in his official personnel file, now preserved at the Ottoman State Archives in Istanbul, and Ottoman governmental correspondence, government publications, the testimonies of European travelers and diplomats, and the work of local chroniclers. So it is um, in part because of the paucity of available sources that individuals on the higher echelons of the Ottoman military and civil bureaucracy have received far less scholarly attention than their British, French, or Russian counterparts uh, during this period, and yet they were as crucial for the shaping of Ottoman imperial policy as their European uh, colleagues. Ahmed Fezi Pasha, uh, Fezi Pasha's career is a particularly interesting one because it sheds light on an aspect of Ottoman imperial rule uh, that is often overlooked. Except for two rather brief stints, um, he spent his entire professional life in Arabia. It is no exaggeration to say um, that he devoted the best part of his life to the expansion of an empire 
that many European observers at the time liked to write off as the sick men of Europe. Now, by looking at the Ottoman Empire from its borderlands, from a frontier region like Yemen, recently conquered, and through the action of officials posted there, we get a very different picture of this polity, one that highlights the energy and creativity spent by its key administrators on securing uh, for the Ottomans a place among the imperial powers of the day and on accumulating and expanding their own personal fortunes. Benjamin Disraeli's famous dictum that the East is a career did not just apply to generations of British colonial administrators, soldiers and scholars, it also applied to the likes of Ahmed Faisi Pasha. Ahmed Faisi was born uh, into a family of Muslim Tatars on the Crimean Peninsula in March 1839, not as a subject of the Ottoman Sultan, uh, but as a subject of Tsar Nicholas I of Russia. Uh, a northern borderland of the Ottoman Empire for nearly four centuries, Crimea had been conquered by Russian military forces in the 1770s. And in the aftermath of the Russian conquest and well into the 19th century, tens of thousands uh, of Crimean Muslims relocated to different parts of the Ottoman Empire, uh, preferring a future, however uncertain, uh, in the last Muslim imperial state of the region to remaining under the authority of the Tsar. Ahmed Faisi and his family were part of this Tatar migration. The son of a local Muslim jurist and teacher, Ahmed Faisi was initially educated in Crimea at a local elementary school, but continued his education in Istanbul, uh, the capital of the Ottoman Empire, first at a military middle school and later at the military academy, from which he graduated on January 25, 1864. This suggests that he came to the Ottoman Empire in his late teens. And three months later, um, in March 1864, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the 5th Regiment of the Imperial Guard. Now, Ahmed Faisi was born at a time when the Ottoman Empire found itself in an increasingly hostile environment marked by the unprecedented territorial expansion uh, of European imperial powers such as Russia and France, and by the separatist policies of prominent Muslim elites in Egypt and Ottoman Christian nationalists in the Balkans. The results were dramatic. Uh, by 1839, Russia had conquered most Ottoman territories in the Caucasus and along the northern shores of the Black Sea. So these things here, I mean, this is an Ottoman map um, that shows the territory of the empire at the height of Faiz, Ahmed Faiz's career in the early 1900s, and at the time... Uh, a huge area here in the Caucasus um, had already been conquered by the Russians, same with the northern shores of the Black Sea. In, uh, by the time Ahmed Faisi was born, um, a, a Greek uh, kingdom had already emerged and the French had started uh, to conquer a very large chunk of um, North Africa that later on became Algeria. So in response to this, uh, the, uh, the Ottoman uh, ruling elites started very systematic efforts uh, to refashion uh, the st structures, the practices of the empire in an attempt uh, to make the Ottoman state more resilient against those threats from the outside and from, uh, from within. And while these uh, policies of state building were applied unevenly across the still vast uh, territory of the empire. So even in 1900, it um, still included a good chunk of southeastern Europe and, uh, and the Middle East. By the end of Ahmed Faisi's life uh, in the early 1900s, a modern Ottoman state had emerged uh, that intruded to an unprecedented degree into the life of his subjects with institutions and practices that range from a ministerial bureaucracy to uh, modern census-taking, cadastral surveys, a um, European conscription-style army, a state education system, and, uh, and the like. As a graduate of the above-mentioned military schools, Ahmed Faisi was, in a sense, a product of these reform efforts. So it was this modern Ottoman state 
uh, that in the making that provided the, uh, the son of a Tata immigrant with an education, a career, and the chance for upward mobility. And as it turned out, the young officer in the guards did not have to wait very long for an opportunity to distinguish himself on the battlefield. Uh, in 1871 to 1873, uh, Ahmed Faisi took part in the reconquest of Asir in um, present-day Saudi Arabia and of Upper Yemen, this area here, which is now the central portion of, uh, of the Republic of Yemen. And during this campaign, he was promoted very quickly to the ranks of major uh, and uh, lieutenant colonel. Now, Yemen uh, is a portion of, uh, of the Middle East and a portion of the late Ottoman Empire that uh, is particularly interesting uh, because uh, Yemen was part of those imperial borderlands among which we can also call, um, count Kurdistan, parts of uh, present-day Iraq, um, Tripolitania, a good part of present-day Libya, uh, into which the Ottoman Empire for the first time really brought substantial uh, and systematic state control. And uh, Ottoman, policymaker, uh, Ottoman policymakers did this uh, because in an attempt to withstand the pressure of European imperial expansion, but also um, challenges from the inside, uh, they felt they could no longer afford to rule some of those frontier regions um, in the offhand way that they had done for many centuries before. And it was uh, in, this, uh, in, in this context that very systematic attempts were made to subjugate local sedentary and nomadic populations to uh, register their property, to collect taxes in a more systematic fashion, and uh, to conscript the young men into the Ottoman, into the Ottoman military. Now, the uh, reconquest of Yemen that the Ottomans had ruled once before in the 16th and early 17th centuries and lost to a local Shiite dynasty uh, is part of this larger phenomenon, but it was also very special because Yemen as you can see here, sits right across uh, from the Horn of Africa. It sits right by the Indian Ocean and across uh, from Sudan and the, the Upper Nile region on the other side of the, um, of the Red Sea. So Yemen was not only adjacent, I would argue, it was very actually central to an area that became a very focal point uh, of European politics of expansion that are often called the scramble for Africa in the um, second half of the 19th century. And uh, for the Ottomans, securing control of this area was specifically important because since the 1830s, the British had installed themselves here in Aden. Aden um, was particularly important for uh, British imperial strategists because it was extremely useful as a coaling station for British steamers on the way from Britain to India, the center of the British Empire. And now, the Ottomans were never convinced that Aden was the only part of Southwest Arabia that the British wanted. On the contrary, um, throughout the period that we are looking at here, uh, Ottoman policymakers were firmly convinced that this was just a staging ground for the British to extend their control further upward, um, north, and eventually conquer the holy sites of Islam uh, at Mecca and Medina. And the holy sites of Islam in Mecca and Medina uh, were of specific importance for the Ottomans to control. Protecting the pilgrimage, being the guardians of the holy sites, uh, was ideologically a centerpiece uh, of, the Ottoman, of, the, of the late Ottoman state. So uh, one of the reasons why the Ottomans reconquered Yemen and in, in the 1870s um, seized control even of the mountainous area, and all the way down into the hinterlands of Aden was to block uh, British imperial expansion. Here, the Ottomans were in direct competition um, with the British Raj, because Aden was governed from British India. Now, uh, strategy was not the only reason that brought the Ottomans back to Southwest Arabia. Um, incidentally, especially 
this part of the uh, Yemeni highlands, often called Lower Yemen, is one of the most fertile areas of the entire Arabian Peninsula. This is the only part of Arabia, this part of Arabia, that gets the monsoon. And in this area, you have uh, the possibility to bring in like two harvests a year. This is the area where, since the 16th century, coffee had been grown on a large scale. And uh, for the Ottomans, uh, recapturing uh, the most fertile area of Arabia also meant taxes. And it meant uh, acquiring a wealthy uh, province. So Ottoman planners drew up all kinds of very ambitious schemes on what to do with this plum piece of, uh, of the Arabian Peninsula. And Ahmed Faisi was directly in the midst of, uh, of this endeavor. Now, in frontier regions of the Ottoman Empire, such as Kurdistan, the Hejaz, Yemen, or Tripolitania, it was rather common for military officers to also fill the higher echelons of provincial government. And so it's actually not surprising uh, to see Ahmed Faisi uh, appointed to an administrative position in the newly created province of Yemen. Once the main combat operations started to wind down in the summer of 1872. The Ottomans had uh, taken about a year to defeat most of the major local lords. There was no larger um, local polity in place. It was a number of uh, local lords and emirs who controlled this area. And uh, they had nothing to withstand. Uh, Ottoman breech-loading rifles, their Krupp breech-loading field artillery, and uh, their modern military logistics. And uh, so... The, the main opponents of the Ottomans, uh, the local Shia rulers, the Zaydi Imams, retreated into uh, this hi uh, the highlands here that are now in the frontier areas between Yemen and Saudi Arabia. And the Ottomans uh, didn't pursue them, didn't uh, push imperial expansion into this area because uh, it was less fertile in the south and um, they were, in terms of their manpower, too thin on the ground to allow that to, ha to happen. So a, an Ottoman province was set up here. Um, local notables were integrated into the lower levels of provincial administration. The higher ranks were administrators from other parts of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, it's in this context that uh, we see uh, Ahmed Faisi now as a district administrator in the initially in the northern parts of the province and then uh, in the 1870s as a district governor of a sub-province called Asir. And that was a trouble spot. This was one of the most uh, difficult to access areas. This was the area where military uh, resistance flared up most often. And the very fact that Ahmed Faisi uh, survived in the position of um, sub-province governor in this area uh, tells us that uh, he was very much appreciated, not just by his immediate boss, the central governor who was uh, headquartered in the provincial capital of Sana'a, but also by the imperial court uh, and by the Sultan Abdul Hamid II himself uh, in Istanbul. And it certainly helped uh, that uh, the Ottoman general, a very highly regarded man by the name of Ahmed Muhtar Pasha, who had led uh, the military campaigns to reconquer Yemen was one of Faisi's mentors, and we can imagine that uh, he um, took very good care of his protege and uh, made sure uh, that um, uh, he was in the good graces and remained in the good graces of the Sultan. And so what we are dealing with um, is an initial remarkably long period of 17 years, first as a military officer uh, and then moving up through the military ranks, but doubling up as an administrator that Faisi spent in Yemen. And this is very, very unusual for Ottoman military commanders and civil administrators alike, uh, because the central government usually liked to rotate people on a more regular basis. It was usually common that people were in positions for two years, maybe three, and um, as 
for a very long time before, uh, the late Ottoman state, too, was concerned that administrators develop too close a connection to their um, local positions, to local society, that they became too powerful and secure in their uh, posts. So uh, it was a good idea. It was felt it was a good idea to ma move them around a bit. So uh, the very fact that Faisi spent 17 years from uh, 1871 to 1887 in the same province um, gives you a sense of how um, much appreciated and how much valued his service as an administrator and as a soldier were. And it's in this time that we really see that he made his mark in the two areas that would distinguish him. First, as a military commander, and um, we know that he came uh, to the attention of his superiors during the conquest of Yemen, otherwise he wouldn't have been promoted as quickly. And we know that he um, embraced uh, very actively the tactics of his commanding generals to uh, knock down uh, local resistance through the quick uh, deployment of mobile columns meant to overwhelm um, local fighters with superior firepower and um, defeat them. In, in, in close combat. And uh, as an administrator, if you read uh, his correspondence to his superiors, both in Sana'a and in Istanbul, um, you get a sense that you are dealing with a man who observes very closely, who has progressively developed a very keen understanding of local affairs, or at the very least, and this is a dis uh, distinction, a qualification that we need to keep in mind for later on, who is capable of projecting that image to his superiors. So he um, wrote very thoughtful uh, memos, we would say today, advising against extending Ottoman rule further into the north. And he said, this is overstretched, this is something that we cannot sustain. Um, let the local chiefs and the local emirs stew in their own juice, so to speak, uh, Ottoman interests are much better served. So he started to cultivate a, a reputation as someone who, know, who knew local affairs and local people and their customs particularly well. And this is something that requires um, some elaboration. I mean, of course, Ottoman rulers had for many centuries been... Um, uh, very, very intent on generating information uh, about the people that they ruled, census taking and uh, collections of, uh, of local customary laws and so on, is something that we have all the way going back to the 15th century. What was new in the 19th is um, something uh, that uh, Michel Foucault in some of his work has described as governmentality, the idea that you objectify uh, local society uh, into a thing that you can study scholarly uh, and that you can develop expertise about uh, and uh, that this expertise is something that specifically is considered a integral part of modern statecraft. And uh, reading through his correspondence and the way people talked and wrote about him, we get a sense that uh, Ahmed Faisi was very keenly aware of that and knew how uh, to um, sort of pull these registers of the knowledgeable, the expert administrator who has a superior understanding of local people very well. And he put this, um, uh, he tried to prove this, and he actually did manage to prove this very effectively but, uh, during his first stint as a governor general. So uh, at the end of his first 17 years in Yemen, from 1885 to 1887, uh, he served as governor general. And uh, during this period, he managed to diffuse uh, a first challenge uh, to the Ottoman position in Yemen on the parts of the local Shia imams. And he was able to do so by playing off uh, the different tribal communities that the Shias were trying to gather under their banner. And those who uh, he couldn't outmaneuver uh, he intimidated um, by using, in a very effective way, the Ottoman military on the spot. And so even though in 1887 he was transferred 
further north uh, to the province of Hejaz, centered on uh, Mecca and Medina, uh, we have a sense that he had brought himself sufficiently to the attention of the powers that be in Istanbul to be made use of when necessary at a later stage. And that later stage uh, came probably sooner than he would have expected. Because in 1891, for the first time, um, a local Shia leader, uh, the Zaidi Imam al-Mansur Muhammad, managed what none of his predecessors had actually managed before. He managed to broker um, a very large coalition uh, of tribal communities and uh, to wield them into a fighting force. And this fighting force uh, struck against the Ottomans first in the, um, in the northern parts of the province and uh, very soon struck very deep into the Ottoman province of Yemen, almost uh, down south to the British sphere of influence. And uh, the Ottomans, as always very keen on economizing and, uh, and um, cutting expenses, uh, they had thinned out their local military on the ground. And so uh, the rebels, concentrated as they, they were, um, didn't face, uh, face the resistance of rather small garrisons. Most of them were overrun, overwhelmed, and um, the uh, commander-in-chief of the Ottoman forces in Yemen proved uh, unable to mount some effective counter-strategy. So within two months, the um, capital, provincial capital of Sana'a had come under siege, was cut off, and uh, the Ottoman central government had no choice but to bring reinforcements from the outside. And it's, um, after what I've mentioned to you, it's not uh, really very surprising that the choice for the command of these forces fell on none other but Ahmed Fezi Pasha. So Ahmed Fezi appears on the scene, uh, disembarking at the head of 8,000 infantry from Damascus and from the southern Anatolian provinces in Hodeida, the main port of Yemen, um, marches through the central mountains, and uh, one by one eliminates uh, the forces that the Shia imams put in his way. And uh, what we see here is essentially a set piece of colonial warfare where he um, very skillfully used the, the strategies he learned from his mentor Ahmed Muhtar Pasha during the conquests of 1871 to 73. Uh, within four weeks, um, Sana'a is uh, relieved and during the next few months, uh, Ahmed Fezi Pasha uh, focuses on counterattacking uh, the rebels, north and south. And I want to share with you an uh, observation on him uh, that is, uh, was authored by the then British correspondent, uh, Walter Harris, who was working for the Times of London. And he happened to be in Yemen uh, at um, this uh, later part of the counteroffensive mounted by Ahmed Fezi. And uh, Walter Harris writes, proclaiming military law, which in this case meant almost no law, throughout the country, the new governor general, that is Ahmed Fezi, offered a reward for the head of every rebel brought to him and turned loose upon the Arabs, his Turkish troops, to loot and plunder their villages. There is no nation in the world that can put down a rebellion as the Turks can. And I should say here uh, that Turks, in the parlance of uh, Englishmen at the time, meant Ottoman. Uh, yet, in spite of the fact that his relations with Ahmed Fezi Pasha were a little strained, he, that is Harris, cannot but testify to his admirable activity and soldier-like bearing, an admiration dimmed only by the cruelty almost necessary of some of his commands. Thus it will be seen that from the day that Ahmed Fezi took over the governor generalship of Yemen, the tide of events had completely changed. A series of Arab victories had ended in a series of Arab defeats. Now, Harry's portrayal of Fezi's counterinsurgency operations was certainly informed by anti-Ottoman bias that was very widespread in the British public of the time, particularly as a result of uh, counterinsurgency measures that the Ottomans had mounted in 1877 in Bulgaria, the famous Bulgarian horrors. And this bias often found expression in the cliché 
of the quote-unquote terrible Turk. It is interesting to note, however, that his perspective is supported by official Ottoman correspondence. For example, when in 1903 an uprising in uh, a part of Yemen quickly threw Ottoman military forces on the defensive, the author of a memorandum urged the government to put Faisi in charge of the operations against the rebels. No one, he claimed, could deal with insurgents as effectively as the former governor general. In support of this point, the official stated that throughout Yemen, people would scare their naughty children with the words, Faisi is coming. Uh, moreover, uh, in the summer of 1892, the provincial government in, in Sana'a had arrested some 57 alleged supporters of the Shia imam. Uh, they were subsequently exiled far away to the Aegean island of Rhodes, then part of the Ottoman Empire, where they would remain until 19, uh, 1908, when the new constitutional regime in Istanbul released them. Uh, by mid-1892, um, the authorities had established a measure of control over those areas that had been affected by the rebellion. Now, who was Faisi at this point? A hero, a villain? He was certainly a hero for Sultan Abdul Hamid II, uh, and uh, even for someone like Walter Harris, because he had really uh, proved himself, again, much more capable than many of his fellow generals in the Ottoman um, uh, military top brass. And um, he had... Uh, re-established control at a moment when Yemen seemed to slip away from the, um, uh, from the control of the sublime state. Now, it is also clear from what, uh, from what we've heard uh, that for most people in Ottoman Yemen, um, uh, Faisi at this point, at the very latest, was a hated figure. And it's very interesting if you look at some of Yemeni poetic folklore. My colleague Paul Dresch at the University of Oxford, when he did his field work, uh, in Upper Yemen, where the, this uh, uprising occurred in the 1970s and 1980s, people recited to him poetry that still was cursing Ahmed Faisi Pasha for being sort of such a, uh, such a horrible person and a, um, at the forefront of Ottoman repression. So certainly for a um, good chunk of the, the local population, he was a villain. He was sort of the ugly face of Ottoman, uh, of Ottoman rule. Now, very, um, uh, in, in, uh, very closely connected to that um, is that um, the victory, the military victory over the, uh, the rebels um, put Ahmed Faisi Pasha into the good books um, of uh, the Sultan and the imperial government in Istanbul, probably for the rest of his career. And uh, he uh, continued to follow uh, military strikes, shock and awe, as um, George W. Bush and, and uh, his, his, his sort of neocon supporters would have called it in 2003, to um, strike against uh, local resistance. And that was the theme of his uh, second governor generalship of Yemen uh, from 1891 to, um, to 1898. And uh, at uh, that point in 1898, uh, Faisi Pasha's uh, sort of luster as a um, military fixer, as a as someone who could strike effectively against um, local resistance, seemed to dim because suddenly he himself had, a, had an uprising on his hand that had not happened before. And Ottoman uh, officials, Ottoman generals, Ottoman governors usually um, took a career dip if under their watch an uprising broke out. And uh, it, um, Faisi was not um, exempt from that. And it didn't terminate his career. He was transferred to become commander-in-chief of the Ottoman military forces in Baghdad, and later on um, prom uh, appointed governor general of Baghdad province. But as we will see in a minute, uh, this was a demotion in the sense that Mubi moved away from Yemen, uh, at least momentarily, uh, cut and terminated his very lucrative um, money extortion connections that he had built very systematically over many years. Now, um, not long after that, in 1905, uh, the, um, the Ottomans faced an even greater military threat. 
the son of the imam who had challenged the Ottomans uh, unsuccessfully in 1891, mounted an even uh, better organized uprising in 1904. Uh, that kept going until 1907. And it's very important to um, look a little bit more closely at the two uprisings. 1891 uh, was an uprising where the local insurgents were still armed with matchlock rifles, uh, sort of 16th century weaponry, uh, and some of them still with swords and spears and so on. So they were not a match uh, for Ottoman uh, modern military weaponry. In 1904 to 1907, things had changed dramatically because of uh, very lucrative and very well-constructed um, supply lines uh, that connected Yemen, the highlands of Yemen, to the international arms and gun running trade, uh, tribesmen uh, in, in this part of Southwest Arabia in the early 1900s were very well armed with state of the art repeating rifles. Martini Henry, Mauser, you, have, you name it. And uh, so what the Ottomans were facing was a very delicate situation in the sense that um, they actually faced an enemy that was not just determined, very well organized, but um, could potentially uh, outgun them. So this time, um, the Ottoman uh, military uh, commanders, I mean the, the Ottoman high command in Yemen, didn't want to take any chance. They didn't mobilize 8,000 troops they mobilized 40,000 troops uh, against um, the second uprising. And they pulled off the, even by late 20th century standards, very significant feat of having those 40,000 troops shipped from Syria, southern Anatolia, and the eastern Balkans to Yemen within three weeks. Uh, and then this is all on steamships, no air, of course, no airlifting, no paratroopers or anything like that. So they got these 40,000 troops there, and um, uh, again, the choice fell on Ahmed Fezi Pasha. Ahmed Fezi Pasha was far away. He was in Baghdad. And so he needed to be brought to the scene, and um, sort of there are these accounts that at age 68 or something like that, he, uh, with a small retinue of um, fellow officers, they crossed um, the empty quarter, the central Arabian desert, on camelback. Uh, within less than a week. Uh, and uh, then boarded a ship, went to Hodeida. He assumed command of the, the, uh, the Ottoman Expeditionary Force and um, started to take on the Zaidi Imam and his army. Uh, this time, counterinsurgency was much slower because the Ottomans faced a much better armed enemy uh, who sometimes dug in, had even learned to use Ottoman field artillery that they had captured, etc. And yet the Ottomans prevailed. And so in September of um, 1905, the Ottomans are back. They have, uh, they have the, uh, ca recaptured Sana'a that had to surrender to the, uh, to, uh, to the local rebels. And um, at this point, Fezi decided or convinced his superiors that this was the time to once and for all root out uh, the Shia imams in Yemen, conquer the northern highlands that the Ottomans had always left, uh, left alone. And this is the, this is the beginning of a, um, a dramatic military campaign north from Sana'a to this place here in the northern mountains called Shahara. And Shahara, and I'm sorry I haven't brought a um, visual here, is a mountain fortress um, surrounded by canyons. And there is one access, there is one single bridge that connects um, the stronghold to the mountains around it. And this is where Imam Yahya, um, the, the local Shia ruler who was the leader of the, the uprising, was headquartered. And for a month, Ahmed Faizi and his troops surround him and uh, with small arms in artillery and sort of all uh, the firepower at their disposal, they are trying to make a dent and they fail. So this is not Lord Kitchener eradicating the Mahdi's army in Omdurman in 1898. This is the reverse. They simply uh, are unable to defeat the imams and have to beat a very costly retreat. Uh, so this could have been the dramatic downfall of Ahmed Faizi, but it isn't. And it isn't, um, I would say, because um, he has, after all, 
saved, and at least that's the perception of the, of the Sultan and his advisors, Yemen, for the Ottomans once again, because the defeat took out place outside the territory of the province. The province itself um, was secure. So Ahmed Faisi seemingly again comes out on top um, as um, sort of the Ottoman military hero, but you can also read this in a different way. And what is very interesting here is uh, the work um, that a military historian, a colleague of mine from Ohio State University, Dr. Vincent Wilhite, has done. And he has analyzed uh, these uh, two uprisings, Ahmed Faisi's generalship and everything. And he very persuasively shows that uh, it was Ahmed Faisi's counterinsurgency operations in the 1890s that, that uh, radicalized a lot of the population, drove them into the arms of the Zaidi imams, uh, and energized uh, the, the Shia imams' local state-building efforts that then allowed for a much more serious uprising and uh, the, that almost terminated the Ottoman um, control over Southwest Arabia to happen. And uh, so you could all essentially say that it was in many ways um, due to, uh, to Faisi Pasha's heavy-handedness that the Ottomans actually got into this tight corner in the first place. And it's also important uh, that even though um, the imams do, uh, the imam Yahya doesn't succeed in ending Ottoman rule in Yemen, 1905 is a turning point because it's at this point that the, the central government realizes with military means they cannot hold on to this par uh, uh, part of the empire. It's simply too costly. It costs too many men. It costs too much money. It is um, it's something they cannot afford. It's such a drain on uh, the uh, for, uh, funds of the Ottomans that are stretched anyways. So what happens is that in 1905 ensues um, it very different policies that are quite different from Ahmed Faisi's that will lead a few years later to an autonomy agreement that brings the Zaidi Imam as an ally under the umbrella of Ottoman rule that uh, includes a form of power sharing and that looks very different from what had come before and then that actually works throughout uh, World War I. The Zaidi Imam does not join, for example, the uh, Amir and Sharif of Mecca, Hussein, in his Arab revolt against, uh, against the Ottomans. Uh, so here we have a, a very mixed picture of Ahmed Faisi. Now let me backtrack um, in the sort of final part of my talk uh, to that other persona that Ahmed Faisi had, namely the persona of the administrator, the expert, the person who supposedly understood local customs and local um, society so well. And um, in 1892, after that first major uprising that shook the Ottomans in, in Yemen uh, was over, uh, the central government dispatches a, a fact-finding commission. A number of inspectors are sent there um, because uh, the, the Grand Vizier, the Sultan, they want to get to the bottom of, well, why actually did this happen? Why did the Ottomans um, become almost overwhelmed by this, um, by this uprising? And um, the uh, in investigation effort is spearheaded by a very serious, no-nonsense man. He is something like an undersecretary in the Ottoman Ministry of Finance, and his name is Namik Effendi. And Namik Effendi travels through the entire province uh, and doesn't leave any stone unturned. He talks to village elders, uh, to local notables, to, uh, to peasants, to merchants, um, to find out why did this happen. And um, he comes up with some very solid evidence that, um, the, uh, that people rose up against the Ottomans because um, pressure uh, through um, a, an overbearing taxation system, through illegal uh, taxation uh, and the like, had simply been too much to bear. So, it, um, so he shifts the blame from the Zaidi Imams who want to recapture Yemen from the Ottomans who threw them out in the 1870s to actually the very system of Ottoman rule, the way the Ottomans act and carry themselves towards the local population. And what we, what we are witnessing in 1892 and 1893 is a head-on clash between uh, the, uh, the, uh, this inspector, Namik Effendi, on one hand, and Ahmed Faisi on the other. And who, uh, the people who phase off here 
are people who represent two uh, dramatically different visions of what the Ottoman Empire should be. Namek Effendi is very much a man of the Tanzimat, of a um, uh, very strong reformist current that is trying to reform and remake the Ottoman Empire into a nation state uh, in which all the different subjects of the Sultan, non-Muslims, Muslims, people of different ethnic communities are all equal before the law. An Ottoman nation state. And um, he says, you know, what uh, Ahmed Faizi has done uh, in, for example, by uh, deporting uh, local leaders is uh, flies completely in the face of um, a policy that will engage and win over the hearts and minds of the local population. Now, many uh, Ottoman administrators were accustomed to look down on um, people in frontier regions, Bedouin tribes, mountain farmers in Yemen, Kurdish uh, tribal communities as savages who were uncivilized, who were at a much lower rung of social hierarchy and the uh, and civilizational hierarchy. And in this sense, they really resembled their British and French counterparts. Now, someone like Namek Effendi said, well, you know, they may not be as civilized as us elite bureaucrats from Istanbul, but even the most savage people deserve equal justice. And they uh, deserve a fair system of investigation. And what uh, actually brought uh, this um, uh, uprising onto, um, onto our heads in the first place. And uh, so he um, is among the bureaucrats who want to remake the Ottoman system He wants to, uh, in, in Yemen. He wants to, um, for example, uh, disempower uh, powerful local sheikhs and intermediaries uh, who uh, had collected uh, taxes for the Ottoman administration, who had represented the Ottoman state to their local tribal and village communities, and um, who at the same time very often had made common cause with Ottoman administrators high and low, including people like Ahmed Faizi, in diverting a not insignificant amount of local tax money into their own, uh, into their own pockets. So Namek Effendi says the sheikhs have to go. We need a more, uh, we need to bring the state more to the, the lower level, to the village level, um, uh, these intermediaries. And the way our administrators and uh, officers have worked with them is harmful. It will cost us Yemen. Um, against that, Faizi very robustly puts his now very tremendous um, prestige as the victor over the imam, and as the person who has, over 20 years, accumulated an uh, intimate and very solid knowledge of local ways. And he says, this is all nonsense. These people are savages. They only recognize their sheikhs and leaders as their natural leaders. We cannot eliminate these intermediaries. Uh, people will rise up against us. Um, uh, Namek Effendi, as, uh, as, a, as an inspector, as an outsider, he has no idea how Yemenis really think, but I do. And because he has uh, this long experience, because he just defeated the, the Zaidi Imams, Ahmed Faisi Pasha gets away with it. And the Sultan sides with him and against the inspector. And uh, Yemen, um, Yemen's administration remains unchanged. Um, Ahmed Faisi gets to pursue his policies of counterinsurgency. And um, because until 1898, uh, the, um, he prevents the reoccurrence of a, um, another revolt, the Sultan and the administration in Istanbul look the other way. They come to the conclusion that with all his extortion of money, with all his corruption, uh, Ahmed Faisal Pasha is the only person uh, who can allow the Ottomans to hold on to Yemen. And it's actually very interesting that not only um, the imperial government, but also British diplomatic observers, like the, the British vice consul in Hodeida, um, make very similar remarks. He is a bad guy, but at least he is effective. He, uh, he is able to hold on to this, um, to this area. And uh, so these um, uh, two things together, his uh, ability to uh, again and again sort of... Um, uh, make his mark, at least in the, um, in the eyes of his superiors, that he is an effective counterinsurgency um, uh, sort of person, 
and that he is also a consummate local expert, uh, allow him to survive. And it's only when his patron, the Sultan, is deposed uh, by the Young Turk revolutionaries uh, in 1909, 1908, uh, that, um, that Ahmed, Fe Ahmed Feizi Pasha finally uh, loses power and rides into the sunset of retirement, and nothing ever happens to him. Uh, the money that uh, he accumulated probably ended up in a nicely secured bank account at the Ottoman Bank in Istanbul, and uh, his members of his family uh, continue as members of the elite. One of his sons becomes uh, a provincial governor, and another one becomes a, a member of the Ottoman parliament. Uh, and, uh, and so um, what does this tell us at the end of the day? Uh, it, it obviously sheds light on the dynamism uh, of the, the Ottoman Empire to really hold on to its status as an imperial power against British and Italian competitors, for example. Uh, but it also sheds light on some of the crucial dysfunctionalities of the empire that uh, where a person as with a checkered a record as, as Ahmed Feizi um, was able to hold on. Now, uh, the Ottoman Empire disappeared uh, three years after Ahmed Feizi had passed away. Uh, and this would be a very convenient point to conclude uh, this talk, but we are not quite there yet, because I would argue that um, the way, um, the legacy that people like him, and there were other Ahmed Faisis in this period, um, left, an important, uh, left an important legacy. The idea that savage peoples, borderland peoples, people who are perceived to be on a lower rang of a civilizational hierarchy, only understand um, the heavy hand of the state, uh, the heavy hand of the military, is something that survived the Ottoman Empire. And um, if you, for example, um, look at, if you fast forward 20, 10 years after Ahmed Feizi's uh, death into 1925, the first critical decade of the Turkish Republic, and incidentally the year when um, the new Turkish Republican state, now headed by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, a former Ottoman uh, general, faces its uh, first important domestic challenge with a serious large-scale um, uprising in the southeast uh, that, from the Republic's perspective, can no longer be called Kurdistan. Uh, and and uh, the counterinsurgency operations are led by people who made their mark in the Ottoman army, who were young officers in the early 1900s. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, the republic's elite took on board many of the statecraft assumptions and ideas of the late Ottoman Empire. And so in uh, the harsh ways in which uh, Kurdish communities were treated um, uh, through uh, the many decades, uh, at least of the early republic, and arguably later on, uh, we see in many ways uh, the legacy of people like Ahmed Feizi, who very much considered themselves modern imperial men, empire builders, um, the people who were uh, there out there at the frontier to make the uh, a modern Ottoman state happen against the people whom they considered the savages. And this is something that they shared with the Ottoman gendarmerie, the uh, Turkish Republican gendarmerie commander um, or district chief. Um, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and in many ways still today. Thank you very much.